Martina Anderson to ask the first question. Martina Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I intend answering questions 1, 8, 12, and 15, uh, along with question 1. So, if I could ask for additional time in this response. Mr. Speaker, this response, uh, as I say, will also answer questions 8, 12, and 15. Northern Ireland has been planning for the deployment of the COVID 19 vaccine for many months. And along with the other devolved administrations, will adhere to the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation advice on the prioritisation of the vaccine. JCVI have advised that the first priorities for any COVID-19 vaccination programme should be the prevention of COVID-19 mortality and the protection of health and social care staff and systems. Secondary priorities should include vaccination of those at increased risk of hospitalisation and at increased risk of exposure and to maintain resilience in essential public services. The model for vaccine deployment has been designed to be pragmatic, agile and flexible. Teams of vaccinators have been trained uh, for a range of professional backgrounds and, in addition to extant HSC staff and primary care staff, in addition to that, 870 individuals have now submitted application forms to help out at, as vaccinators during the vaccination programme. Phase one of the programme officially began on Tuesday, the 8th of December, with all four UK countries launching their vaccination programmes. In Northern Ireland, the programme began at the Belfast Trust vaccination site, where vaccinators from across Northern Ireland were invited to receive the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. All the trusts intend to start vaccinating health and social care workers from the week commencing the 14th of December, although in light of the planned delivery schedules of the vaccine in December and January, the staff programme will now have to be phased, starting with those at greatest risk or working directly with patients at the greatest risks. Ultimately, all health and social care workers will have the opportunity to be vaccinated, which is expected to be within the first quarter of 2021. There will be seven trust vaccination sites operating in Northern Ireland. These will be located at the Royal Victoria Hospital, the Ulster Hospital Dundonald, uh, South Lakes Leisure Centre in Craig Avon, the Seven Towers Leisure Centre in Ballymena, the Foyle Arena in London Derry, Oma Leisure Centre in Oma, and the Lakeside Leisure Centre in Ennis Gillen. My officials have worked closely with the MRHA to develop a deployment model that will enable deployment in care homes and which takes into account the unique characteristics of this vaccine, which includes transport requirements. Teams from health trusts will be vaccinating care home residents, working closely with local GPs on their comprehensive health trust governance arrangements designed to ensure the integrity and efficacy of the vaccine is maintained throughout. Trust mobile vaccination teams intend to visit all the homes over the next few weeks, subject to dealing with any that have a current COVID-19 outbreak. We are currently considering how arrangements might be extended to include the over-80s living in the community. And due to the logistics, the strict handling conditions attached to the use of the Pfizer vaccine, it is very difficult to deploy the vaccine in a GP setting. But every effort is being made to try and arrange for either a trust-based or GP-based programme for the over-80s. From early January 21, subject to the availability of a suitable vaccine, it is intended to roll out the programme through primary care-led vaccination clinics, which will be responsible for the vaccination of the vast majority of eligible individuals over 50, 50 years over. GPs will work their way down through the eligible cohorts, starting with the oldest first. While the start of the vaccination programme is highly positive development, I must stress that it will be months before the vaccination programme is complete and we are entering an extremely challenging winter for the NHS in Northern Ireland. And I cannot stress enough the importance that the population follows the public health advice to drive down infections. Uh, Martina Anderson, supplementary. Uh, me on. Good Ira. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, by common consent, the British government has been somewhat shambolic in their handling of this um, pandemic since the outset of it. I can't point to a single thing that they've got right. So, given what you said about the vaccine, I think it's unfortunate uh, that we have to depend on them for the supply of it. But in light of what you said about the phased mm -hmm. approach, Minister, can you guarantee that all health care and social care workers will have vaccine access to the vaccine within a clearly defined time frame, particularly the staff at Alton Gavin Hospital and domiciliary care workers who have been under considerable pressure for a, a very long time? Um. I thank uh, the member for, for her comments, but uh, as I'm sure she'll be aware, I don't agree 
uh, with them in regards to the vaccine. I think if we had been left to our own to procure this vaccine, we would neither have the buying power nor the financial capability to pre-buy uh, seven different vaccines to the extent that we have, or to be able to provide the accreditation and certification that the MRHA has provided to us to allow us to be part of some of the first delivery of vaccines uh, across the world. Uh, we are now into our care homes and vaccinating care home staff and residents. So, in regards to the delivery of vaccines, we have already received upwards of 50,000 of the Pfizer vaccine, which allows us to vaccinate just over 20,000 individuals. And as I said, the JVCI, which is the Joint Committee on Vaccine and Immunisation, has a clear priority of those who receive the vaccine and on certain levels. So, in regards to can I guarantee access to vaccine? Um, yes, I can, because we are part of that UK pre-buying, which will see a massive number of vaccines made available to us, and additional vaccines, once they receive the MRHA uh, accreditation and approval, will also be part of that additional programme. I call Pam Cameron. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And can I just put on record my thanks to the British Government for for first of all um, coming up with this incredible vaccine at this time and being the first in the world to do so, and also um, ma ma ensuring that Northern Ireland is part of that supply, as is the rest of the UK. Um, in terms of the vaccination programme, I wanted to ask the Minister that you know, once the vaccination programme has completed within an individual care home, um, will the visitation then be relaxed and how soon will we see that happen given that many care home residents um, are often in the last years or months of their life? Um, I, I thank the member for, for the point that she makes and as I think as we've been clear in the past it's not the initial vaccine that's the important one, it's the second one and then giving it time to actually have that effic efficacy. Uh, kick in. I, I can give her an update that as of today we have had our vaccination teams across all five trusts and have vaccinated up to 54 care homes. Uh, so we have started with those with the largest number of residents and that will be in the region of just shy of 4,000 individuals, which includes care home residents, care home workers and also our vaccination teams themselves. So while the vaccine does provide a crucial tool and allowing visiting to take part, we have to make sure that we not only get that first vaccine in place, but follow up with the second vaccine, and would encourage that as many residents and staff members take up the offer that is there of a free vaccine uh, delivered through the, the NHS, and also supported and paid for by the British Government. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I also put on record my thanks to the UK Government for ruling out the vaccine first across the whole of the world? Um, could I ask the, the Minister, could he outline plans for the rollout of the vaccine in North Down and potential venues that they might be looking at? Um, I, I thank the member for his uh, ask for a press release. Um, I can give him, give him the update as well that there will be no geographical specific priorities for any area. It will stick uh, strictly by the JCVI uh, accreditation and deliberation of those who need it. Most, as I said earlier, the, the venues uh, that will be taken in the, in, the, in the Southern Trust is the South Lakes uh, Centre in Craig Avon, and then in the South Eastern Trust will be the Ulster Hospital at Dundonald. So those programmes will start up for our initial programmes, but the care homes as well will also be, be, be in, in receive the vaccination within the members' constituency as well for the residents um, and the staff as well. I call Michelle McLevine. Speaker. Um, I thank the member for her question. Training for those administering the COVID-19 vaccine is mostly completed online. Uh, the HSC Clinical Education Centre has provided some one-to-one -one training within the existing service level agreement, and there have to date been no additional costs. Uh, I thank, thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask what consideration is being given to review the policy where only nurses who retired after 2015 can be added to the NMC register, when clearly there are a sizable number of qualified people who retired prior to that date who could assist with the vaccination programme? Um, the member makes a, a valid point in regards to, to the timeliness of the cutoffs of the accreditation. If there is anybody individually she does know of, I'd gladly receive you know, contact details for them. I've been contacted by a number of GPs who find themselves in exactly that same 
same point where the timeline that has been set, where they can engage and maybe after an hour, an hour, an hour and a half online training, they can be part of the vaccination programme. So if the members have individuals that they do know of, I'm, I'm happy to take them forward because we, you know, we are encouraged by the high number of people who have come forward to be part of this very important programme, 870 to date. Uh, who are going through a process of what will hopefully be mass vaccination programmes across the entirety of Northern Ireland, including North Down. I call Colin Kildrenew. Gorham Agard, last chance to you, and thank you to the Minister for the answers. Minister, the Public Health Agency has been uh, in, in common with many agencies, but clearly been greatly challenged by the significant demands of COVID-19. Will you ensure that the lessons learned and the experience gained over the past recent months is retained so the Public Health Agency emerges from this crisis with a greater and wider capacity? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question. I am unsure how it links in with the, the, the main substance of, of the question that uh, the member for Strangford actually asked, but I can do that. We have seen expansive uh, uh, investment not only in finance but also in people in regards to the PHA to ensure that they can complete all the duties that they have been doing over, over this pandemic, including what has been a very impressive increase in the test, trace and protect system, where they are now uh, contacting well over 90% well over of, of those targets within a 24-hour period and a 48-hour period, then to the lesser extent, uh, to a far more effective level. Uh, than other parts of, of the juristic of, of the devolved administrations. So the strength that we have in our public health agency has been uh, added to, has been improved, and will continue to be invested in. And the, the first and deputy first minister, uh, along with myself, visited our test trace and protect system in the PHA building in the county hall in Balmain on Friday. And as far as I'm aware, from from their press statements and their public statements, they were very impressed with what they saw in the service being delivered. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I thank you for your answer so far. And Minister, I welcome the high quality and training that has been given to the vaccinators that maintain our health services' high professional standards. Can you, Minister, tell the House this afternoon how many vaccinators have so far been employed by your, depart by your department to administer the vaccine? Um, I, I thank the member for, for her answer, and I think, as I said, and the answer to the, the initial question, I think we have 870. Um, people who have come forward to be part of that vaccination programme. They are part of the initial wave of those who actually receive the vaccine. Um, so that is, as I say, 870 individuals have now submitted application forms to help out as vaccinations during the vaccination programme. And of course, they are also supported by administrative workers and delivery workers and everybody else who is playing a vital role in pharmacy as well in making sure that we can get this, this vaccine delivered uh, during the, the very strict delivery processes that need and management protocols that are in place. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, and Deputy Speaker, if we indulge, uh, maybe ask for a little extra time in, in addressing this, which is an important, important subject. Elective care waiting times were unacceptable before COVID-19, and unfortunately, they will, they will be even worse after COVID-19, because the need to redirect HSC resources to respond to the pandemic has had an inevitable and serious impact on waiting lists. The spread of coronavirus has continued to cause serious disruption to our health and social care system, and it was unavoidable that elective care activity would reduce due to the need to redeploy staff to COVID-related activity. In the wake of the first wave of the pandemic, I was clear that rebuilding services across all programmes of care, including elective, while protecting staff and the public from COVID-19, was a key priority for the health service. And thanks to the huge efforts of our health service staff, much progress was made to restart of elective care services. During the first wave, our health and social care system delivered 12,150 new outpatient consultations in April, and there were 29,163 in October. In terms of inpatient or day case procedures, 4,859 were delivered in April, and that compared to 13,301 in October. Similarly, there were 39,907 outpatient reviews in April, compared with 56,071 in October. Overall, there were over 73 per cent more activity in October than there was in April. 
Our surge and rebuild plans were effective in keeping services going. Each trust surpassed its target for the period of July to September, but the pandemic has undoubtedly exacerbated what was already a crisis with waiting times. And given the reduction in the level of elective activity that can be delivered by trusts as they focus their efforts on responding to the pandemic, trusts have been utilising the local independent sector capacity to support uh, the delivery of core health services activity and rebuilding our services. And during the period of the 1st of April to the 15th of November, approximately 3,500 patients have had their procedure carried out in the independent sector, and that was paid for by the health service. And rebuilding services trusts have taken into account of new and innovative practices that have introduced during the first wave of the pandemic. For example, the use of technology such as telephone and virtual clinics to a much greater extent. Outpatient appointments have, where possible and where appropriate, move to telephone appointments, and in addition, a growing number of specialities are adopting virtual clinics using video conferencing, which will embed those recent innovations will be essential to maximise elective activity during the pandemic and into the future. Waiting lists were a clear priority in New Decade New Approach. However, these plans have been delayed by the pandemic, and I am conscious that public spending is likely to be very constrained next year, and that all departments will be facing seriously funding pressures. Tackling waiting lists will not be possible without sustained and substantial investment and additional staffing. I call Robin Newton for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his uh, very detailed answer. And it's obviously a subject that uh, he is taking uh, very seriously. I do want to pay tribute to the Minister in the sense that when I have raised matters, uh, around the waiting list or when procedures will take place. He has always been extremely helpful uh, in that, in that uh, regard. Can I ask you, Minister, though, the, the picture you've painted is rather a bleak picture for those who are perhaps in the uh, diagnostic area wanting uh, treat, wait, awaiting treatments, cancer patients, diabetes patients. Uh, I assume from what you've said, Minister, that you will be making a bid uh, to the executive for increased funding uh, in, in the forthcoming de days, and if that if that funding becomes available, when might we expect to see waiting lists come down to what approaching a normal situation? Um, I, I thank the, the member for for his pertinent question. In regards to to bidding, of course, I will be bidding to. For, for as much as I can possibly chance my arm in regards to how we can tackle these waiting lists. As I said, when I took up this post back in January, it was an executive priority. There were additional monies under New Decade, New Approach assigned to that because as an executive, as an assembly and as a society, we, we realised that our waiting lists were too long. They have got longer. Uh, and we're looking now about how we actually reconfigure some of our services um, from day elective units uh, in Lagan Valley, which I which I visited last week, where the surgeons, the nurses, and the staff themselves have um, what I would call exciting plans about how they can reconfigure how we del deliver services across Northern Ireland. One of the things we've seen coming out of COVID is a breaking down of silos that weren't, weren't, weren't created either intentionally or systemically, but just grew up over time. We've seen now surgeons from Belfast willing to travel to the Swall and take lists and patients with them to make use of our facilities that are in another part of, of Northern Ireland. So we're no, look, no longer looking at simply working in trusts or trying to centralise services. We're now looking at a regional approach, which I am hopeful once we get through this pandemic, and I firmly believe we will, that the new working procedures and the new collaborations that we've seen across a number of specialities uh, and a number of disciplines will make a, seriously dent, a serious dent into our waiting list, but it is necessitated on the additional funding that we need to be able to do that, because through that funding we can support more staff to actually deliver the services we need. I call Emma Sheeran. Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, in the past, um, some have used the cross-border directive um, as a means of getting treated in the 26 counties um, because of the long waiting lists. Minister, what actions have you taken to ensure that this method is still available post-Brexit? Um, that, that, that negotiation is, uh, our conversation is ongoing, not just with ourselves, but also between the Irish Government and Westminster as well, because some parts of it are devolved, but some parts of it are actually centralised. 
as well. So there, there's a three-way conversation going on at this moment in time uh, with officials. Uh, there's a North-South Ministerial Council meeting due um, in a few days' time where we will raise that subject again because we're fully aware uh, of not just uh, patients from Northern Ireland go travelling to the Republic of Ireland, but also large numbers of patients from the Republic of Ireland coming into Northern Ireland for cataract operations and such. But we already have, and I think as we touched on yesterday, a number of cross-border working uh, relationships, uh, children's uh, cardiac surgery, uh, been performed in Dublin, the support that we can provide in Alton Gelvin for, for cancer services and palliative care. Those all work extant of Brexit. There, there, there are negotiations and, and relationships that we have with the Irish government, so they'll be able to continue, uh, as we already have, and we continue to build on those as well, even in regards to how we uh, can provide some kidney transplant and organ transplant uh, services from members of the Irish Republic. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answer so far. Would the Minister have an update on the waiting list in the Western Trusts, uh, which was recently identified as, as some, of the, some of the highest waiting lists in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the Member for her question. It is not statistics that I, I have to hand today, but I can certainly provide her with an update. But as I say, when we look at waiting lists now a number of, across a number of disciplines, uh, we are now looking at a more regionalised approach. Um, what I would like to see is the same level of access to a procedure, no matter where somebody lived in Northern Ireland, not, a, not dependent solely on where their trust was and the capacity was, it was solely in one trust. And I think it's one of the things, as I said earlier, that we have seen through COVID uh, and coming out of COVID is that greater collaboration of surgeons willing to travel, of patients willing to travel, and of, as, as of us actually delivering the services to people when they need it, not, also, not always on their doorstep. And I think that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, some of the challenges that we have politicians often face within our health service where um, the campaign starts to try and retain everything um, on our doorstep. But when we see now that patients are willing to travel and health professionals are willing to travel, I think this place uh, will be well placed actually to support the work that our health service is willing to do in regards to how it tackles our waiting list, but also supports the patients uh, that it wants to see and wants to support. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. With regards to waiting lists and pressures, Minister, I am led to believe that there are no neonatal cots available at any hospital in Northern Ireland and indeed even on the island of Ireland. Minister, can you clarify if this is the position and if it is, what urgent action is being taken so that um, transfers are being avoided to GB? Thank you. Um, I thank the member for, for her question. I am unsure exactly of, of the term neonatal courts and, and what she actually means or at what point of time uh, none are available. But if, if you look on the, the departmental website, we cover the number of ICU beds that are also always available uh, and, and paediatrics. I do not think at any time that that has shown them being completely full. Um, so I am happy to take the, the matter specifically up with the member after this. But in regards to that transferability between us being able to, to transfer patients, especially paediatric patients, to the Republic of Ireland, we have a relationship built up there, especially in critical care, where patients, if need be, can move either direction, north-south or south to north as well, but also east-west as well, because, uh, as I am fully aware as well, when, when we do need uh, to send some of our, our patients and more, more, the more vulnerable children when they do need some of the specialist surgeries. We do have access to those operations and those skilled professionals in Birmingham Hospital and Evelina Hospital as well, so those working relationships are there. But in regards to the specific issue that the member raises and, and no neonatal cots available on the island, will follow that up if she can provide the detail. Moving on, I call John O'Dowd. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And Kies Iverkeer, question number four. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Uh, the executive ha has discussed this matter many times and has sought uh, numerous pieces of legal advice. And I am pleased to report that the executive agreed to my latest proposals at our meeting uh, last Tuesday. The Regional Business Services Organisation has now been instructed to make the necessary arrangements for reimbursement of any deductions previously made to pay. Call John O'Dowd for something. Uh, thank you, Minister. And the question was obviously tabled before the very welcome announcement uh, last week. I may claim in the press that my question forced you to do it, <laughs> but uh, it is a very welcome uh, announcement. Can the Minister indicate as to whether uh, those nurses will have 
this money in their wage packets before the Christmas break. I thank the member, and look, he won't be the only one who'll take credit for my announcements because, like anything else, success and delivery has many fathers. Um, the payments will be made. I hope that the payments will be made by my business services organisation, and they will be in the December payroll. Um, BSO has done a tremendous amount of work since I gave the direction to try and get this into place, and I can guarantee if it's not in the December payroll, they will definitely be paid in January. So our intention is to get it out to as many as possible before Christmas, and I want to thank and congratulate our business services organisation for moving so swiftly uh, to deliver this. Nicole Mark Dorgan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Does the Minister acknowledge the vital role played by our student, nurses and midwives working alongside our paid, albeit underpaid, health workers in extremely circumstances? And will he reconsider the decision not to pay them for their priceless contribution at this time, when the situation due to COVID appears as perilous as ever? That is yet another question clearly beyond the original question uh, the Minister may or may not choose to answer. Um, I, I, I thank the, the Deputy Speaker for his direction, but I often ask, answer many questions in here. Uh, in regards to, he talks about a decision being made, can I just clarify um, that in regards to the payment of student nurses, it's the regular requirement that nursing and midwifery students complete 2,300 clinical placement hours to be able to join the registry of nursing and midwifery council. Um, these emergency standards actually ended uh, on the 30th of September with students returning to supernumerary status. There are no plans to reinstate these arrangements at the present time. It is a UK-wide uh, position. The Nursing and Midwifery Council have issued a joint statement uh, which was signed by the four UK Chief Nursing Officers confirming the present position on keeping programmes on track and safeguarding the supernumerary status. So, as members will be aware, that is a decision that was taken by the Nursing Midwifery Council uh, in regards to meeting their requirements uh, for students to be able to complete the 2,300 clinical placement hours. So, it is not the fact uh, that we do not value the work that they do. We do. Uh, we greatly value the work they do and the commitment that they give to those roles, even in a training capacity. Uh, but the statement has been made by the Nursing and Midwifery Council in regards to the supernumerary status of nursing students. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, I wanted to ask the Minister around the whole strike issue, whether he is concerned that nurses will be forced to strike again in future, given there has been no movement on the safe staffing legislation uh, to date. In, in regards to that, I, I do not see any uh, opportunity where where nurses should be moved to, to strike, uh, because I do not recognise uh, the statement that there has been no movement to date in safeguard, safe, safe st staffing. There has been engagement and conversations uh, in regards to what the terms of reference like on engagement between my department and workforce planning and the unions involved. The member will be fully aware that I gave a commitment uh, and the executive gave a commitment when we were able to bring the nurses and our healthcare workers off the picket line. Uh, earlier this year that not just pay party, but safe, safe staffing was also a priority uh, for both me or, uh, and my department, uh, but not just them, but also the executive as well. So that work is ongoing. Uh, there are a number of avenues being looked at, whether we follow the Scottish model or the Welsh model, whether it requires legislation or a framework model as well, and what can be done uh, and what time actually we have left in the rest of this mandate as we bringing forward that legislation to make sure that the safe staffing and the rest of the framework commitments that the executive signed up to are delivered. I call Sinead Ennis, but you may not get a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, question five, please. Um, I, I thank the member for her question. On the 10th of December, my department issued adi additional guidance on Christmas visiting arrangements in care home settings. It is available on the NI Direct and Department of Health websites. This additional guidance emphasises that care homes should recognise the right to a family life for those in care homes, and in particular the importance many people attach to seeing family and friends over the Christmas period. Care homes are asked to make particular efforts at this time to facilitate visiting in line with the regional visiting guidance by offering a range of options for visiting. 
That includes indoor visiting rooms or areas, visiting pods, outdoor visiting and virtual visits that can take place in line with the care homes visiting policy. Visits into care homes are preferable to those out of care homes um, by the residents. Longer visits away from the home carry greater risk and shorter visits. A daily for a few hours are therefore preferable if a visit away from the care home is to take place. If a visit out of the care home is agreed, a number of measures to mitigate the risk of bringing infection back into the care home are identified. While away from the care home, the resident should only be in contact with one household bubble. Members of this bubble should strictly limit their contacts with others in the two weeks before a visit from the care home resident. Other precautions, such as good personal hygiene and regular hand washing by everyone, should be maintained. And on returning to the home, even if only visiting away for a few hours, the resident will have to self-isolate. The impact of this period of isolation on the resident, as well as the care home's ability to accommodate such periods of self-isolation, should be carefully considered by the resident, families, friends and care home staff in any discussions. But I recognise the need for families to come together at Christmas, but it is critical that we keep doing everything we can to stop the virus spreading while we begin the process of vaccinating those considered most at risk from coronavirus. And that is the end of our period of time for our uh, listed questions to the Minister of Health. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Joanne Bunning. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister when does he anticipate a move to rapid testing regime for care homes, please? Um, I, I thank the member for, for her question in regards to the support that we have given to care homes. Uh, you know, it is a welcome indicator today that we have are managing uh, 87 care homes that have outbreaks, although it's a challenging, for, challenging time for those homes and the residents in them. It's good to see that we are beginning to see that, that decrease, and that has been brought about um, by the testing regime that we currently have in place, where we test weekly. What we've actually seen now is a greater ability to identify asymptomatic uh, residents and staff due to the weekly programme. And of those, um, of those 87 confirmed homes, um, only 40 are currently showing symptomatic, so our weekly testing programme has picked those up. So moving to the mass testing programme that we have seen being piloted in parts of South East England. It is something that my expert advisory group on testing is keeping an eye on to make sure that we can use that testing to the maximum efficiency and efficacy as well to so facilitate not just support for the care home residents and staff, but also allow safer visiting as well. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for his answer. So moving now towards the vaccine, he'll be aware that there are numerous people who have underlying conditions which prevents them from taking the vaccine, um, but they remain vulnerable um, and will do until an alternative is found. When does he envisage something will be available to protect those people who have underlying conditions and who remain vulnerable in these circumstances? Uh, and again, I, I thank the, the member for, um, for, for that question in regards to vaccines. I suppose one of the things that we have been working closely with, and that's why we take our guidance from MRHA, MRHA and the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation in regards to what vaccines are suitable for certain particular cohorts, uh, it is a welcome step that the Pfizer one is suitable and being able to use in care home residents and staff because we can get that and we have got that vaccination programme started. As I said earlier, just over 4,000 people vaccinated to date um, since we received that accreditation. Uh, and as, it's, as each vaccine comes forward, as been accredited by MRHA, we look at the Green Book guidance as to see what clinical uh, groups it's suitable for, but also to ensure what clinical groups it's not suitable for. And that's the guidance and training that are given to all our vaccinators before they actually go out to deliver a vaccine to an individual. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, um, Principal Speaker. Um, Minister, it's my understanding that the PHA dedicated education tracing team will close for Christmas on the 23rd of December at 4 o'clock. Given some pupils across Northern Ireland will be in school on the 21st and 22nd of December, can you confirm who will be responsible for the contact tracing of any pupils who test pos positive after that time? The PHA's contact tracing team themselves, the greater team will take over that, but it has been work of a very specialised cell uh, to support principals and staff. Call Kelly Armstrong for supplementary. And can I ask, as a parent of a pupil in Northern Ireland, parents aren't aware of how to report this because the children will be out of school at that stage. Will there be any um, work done by the PHA and yourselves to make sure that that goes through the education system before children finish for Christmas? 
Um, in regards to, to that specific guidance will be provided, I'm sure, by the Education Authority to schools, um, but I'll ask and ensure the PHA does carry forward that communication so that that clear line of sight and guidance is there and accessible. But should I say, you no, know, any child that does present with symptoms um, of COVID-19 goes through the same process as an adult when it comes to identifying or access testing, then after that point, should they not be in school? Call Declan McLear. Minister, in response to a previous question, you indicated that residents of care homes have a requirement to isolate for 14 days following an outside visit. Um, there are situations where many care homes simply do not have that capacity. And what would be your advice to uh, care homes on how to respond to this? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member, and that is part of the guidance that we've given to the, the care home visit actually over Christmas. It is important that for those uh, individuals and families who are able to take someone out of a home for that family visit, which is you know, over a special time of year as well, that we also take the same precautions uh, when that individual returns to the care home as well. So there are uh, additional pressures, and that's what I said in regards to someone refer or coming back into a care home as well, that on returning to the home, uh, the resident will have to isolate, and the impact of that period of isolation on, on the resident has to take, be taken into consideration. So, so for what may be a supportive and welcome three hours respite over a Christmas period, um, back into the family home also has to be balanced by the challenges, even to that individual of the period of self-isolation, that they will have to, to take part in uh, when they return to the home. So that's why I, I, I've said in, in an earlier answer that should be carefully considered uh, by the residents, by families, by friends, and the care home staff, because, of course, the more... Uh, more residents that leave a care home and return, the more pressure it will put on some of the care home facilities in regards to being able to provide that support of self-isolation. Um, the Minister will also be aware that the visiting restrictions also remain in place in uh, maternity wards, for example. Um, has the Minister any um, plans to, to review this in the coming weeks? Um, our, our visiting policies is something that we keep um, under constant review, uh, especially in regards to where we see the coronavirus um, spread across the community as well. So where we see increased community spread, we also have to add additional uh, restrictions uh, to visiting capacity as well. So until we get into a place where we see a continued reduction in the number of COVID cases that are active uh, in our community, it is highly unlikely that we will see a massive change in any visiting policy uh, in regards to hospitals because what we also must remember, even coming up to Christmas, as the member's original question was about, the virus doesn't recognise time of year, calendar or social events, so we always have to bear the same due care and caution no matter what time of year. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the, the, the Minister. If maybe we would get away from COVID a little bit and, and focus on some uh, good news stories that sometimes get missed. Uh, with all the doom and gloom, and we might even break a smile on the minister's face. Uh, but come the 21st uh, of March, 2020, uh, sorry, come uh, March 2021, Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK uh, without an opt-out organ donation system. And therefore, I welcome the minister's decision to run a consultation on the soft out um, option. Can the minister outline the next steps of the process once the consultation closes in February? Um, I, I thank the member. Um, I, I try to smile occasionally. It's not easy being an Ulster Unionist, but um, <laughs> what I will say, say to the member, and he he'll will be fully aware, you know, of the work that was originally commenced on this issue by our party colleague Joanne Dobson. Um, so it is something that we, as a party, have committed to in the past, and that's why I was pleased to launch the public consultation on the introduction of a statutory soft opt-out system um, earlier this week. The consultation runs to the 19th of February. Uh, at that point, my department will publish details of public engagement events uh, that will take place in the new year to ensure that all stakeholders have an opportunity to hear about the proposals and submit their responses. Legislation will be required to give effect to these proposals um, following the consultation period. It is therefore my intention to bring a draft bill to the Assembly at the earliest opportunity, subject to the advice of the Office of the Legislative Council. 
if feasible within the current mandate and the agreement of the executive to proceed. And I would encourage everyone to read about the consultation and submit uh, a response on the department's website. In the meantime, I urge everyone to discuss their wishes about organ donation and their family and friends and look forward to the support of the Health Committee as well and also bring them forward uh, the legislation as expedient and as quick as possible. I call Doug Beatty for supplementary. Uh, thanks, Minister. And I would want to go on record as well um, to recognise the work that has been done by um, Joanne Dobson uh, previously. But sticking on the donation um, uh, issues, uh, further changes to blood donation referral rules uh, have been brought in to allow more gay men uh, to donate. Uh, can, they outline, uh, can the Minister outline the changes uh, and the benefits to this? Thank the members also an announcement that was made over the weekend. Um, I made that decision based on the advice from the Advisory Committee on the Safety of Blood, Tissues and Organs, uh, following its consideration on a report by, made for the assessment of individual risk steering group. Um, the recommendation uh, itself is to implement uh, the introduction of an ind individual behaviour based risk assessment that will allow some men who have sex with men MSM to donate blood if they have had one sexual partner who has been their partner for more than three months. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce this change to donor, the donor deferral policy in Northern Ireland, which means MSM and longer term partnerships will no longer be automatically deferred from donating blood, provided they have been with the same partner for the previous three months. I, I want to see more people able to donate blood. Um, however, I want to make sure it's also safe. Uh, and my decision to reduce the referral period for 12 months to three earlier this year was also based on SABTO and VICE. So I look forward to seeing more uh, donors on the Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion uh, Services Register. Uh, being a regular donor myself, I know the vital importance that giving blood actually gives because every, every pint or every donation given can save up to three lives or have an effect on three lives. So the more people we have eligible to donate blood, the better it is for all of us. Question number five has been withdrawn, so I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, a meeting will take place later today with the Four Nations, along with Michael Gove, to look at the uh, restrictions over the Christmas period. Uh, what assessment does the Minister give in terms of what action should be taken, if any, over that period? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, and he's right, that, decision, or that discussion is being taken by the, the three devolved nations and chaired by Michael Gove this afternoon. As he will be aware, the announcement was made on a UK-wide basis uh, by UK Prime Ministers, First Ministers and Deputy First Ministers. Uh, that discussion is being had, as being supported by decisions and recommendations coming forward from the four chief medical officers across the nations as well. And as the member well knows that I never comment before a decision or a discussion is had, so we'll wait to see the outcome of that meeting and what it recommends. Call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank the Minister for response. I'm going to put it a slightly different way. Uh, Dr Tom Black had said that he believes that a four-week lockdown uh, would be logical uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, what, what is the view of the Minister and what is the view of the Chief Medical Officer as to whether or not additional restrictions are required uh, prior or during the Christmas period? Um, I can nearly just say I refer the member to my further answer, but he will be aware that uh, in regards to where we currently see COVID and the spread uh, and the infection rates, uh, although stable, still slightly increasing, the number of inpatients we have in our hospitals has not decreased. In fact, has not decreased at all over the last number of weeks. So the two-week restrictions that we have have seen um, a stabilisation of those numbers still too high. Uh, so I don't think the member would be surprised to know that I will be bringing a paper um, to the executive on Thursday with a number of recommendations. But as I said earlier, he'll also know me well enough that I make those recommendations to the executive so the discussion can be had there. I call Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, I've heard you talk before about the care home sick leave support funding that is in place for some, uh, well, for all of social care organisations, but they're not all availing of it. So, what's the department to do to try and encourage those organisations to avail of it so that the carers can get some kind of financial support for sick leave pay? Um, and, and the member rightly, yeah, I think the member rightly identifies one of the biggest frustrations. Uh, that I have and the department has as well. At the initial outbreak and the initial waves of this, of this pandemic, uh, where care homes and their owners came looking for support 
uh, and the workers in them came looking for financial support um, so that they were impeded by having to take a statutory sick pay should they either contact COVID or become a, a contact case of COVID. We put financial supports into place that would support care homes to support their workers through what would be a very challenging period of, of isolation. We have regular engagement with care home providers. Uh, that is currently ongoing in a number of other areas. So I would encourage all care home providers, owners, uh, shareholders to take up uh, the financial supports that are provided my, by my department to ensure their workers are supported during any period of, of illness they have to take due to either being a, a positive COVID case or a contact case as well. That's what that finance is there for. That's what guidance is there for, and that's what that support is there for. The member has a brief supplementary. One of my constituents contacted me today. There's been a number across Derry, and I know they're being forced to take their annual leave. Uh, and they are not getting that kind of support. So can you do some more to try and encourage? And we are encouraging the organisations, but we need to get that message across, particularly to the carers. And I think by, by the member raising it here today, and my answer hopefully reinforces that message, uh, that support and funding was there for a reason. It was there to support the workers, to support the owners of the care homes, but mostly importantly to support the, the residents of the care homes. As well, so it's there. The message has been loud and clear, and it's one that my department will continue to make to the care home providers. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister of Health. I ask members to take their ease for a few moments as we change those at the table.